You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show with your host, Brian Callen. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my guest is assistant professor at NYU in Environmental Studies, and she goes by the name of Jennifer Jacquet. Not Jacket, but Jacquet. I, w- I would say Jacques- Jacquet, because it just sounded, <laughs> sounds more French. Because Jennifer. you've taken Michelle Thomas French. Yeah. <laughs> Je- Je- um, Jennifer, we're going to get in your book um, called Is Shame Necessary? New uses for an old tool. I loved it. I know Hunter did, and Hunter is the one that said you got to read this book. Um, and uh, we're going to get into your brain. I do have to say, you are a you belong kind of in front of a camera. You kind of belong on the cover of a magazine. It's it, usually when you think of professors, you think of I don't know somebody who's got gray hair and they've got the posture of a jumbo shrimp, and you're <laughs> the exact opposite of that. So, but you didn't want to Skype with us. And- I'm a. I'm a tiny elephant is that what you're saying i'm saying you're a beautiful woman i think that's <laughs> oh, okay. that's what i'm trying to get at you've got brain you know when you write a book this good and i can't wait to get into it you figure you know anyway you've got you're the whole package jennifer that's what i'm trying to say all right so congratulations on your bone structure and on your book which obviously <laughs> took a lot of thought so let's get into that uh no yeah that. one of them took a lot more effort <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it i love it all right well so is shame necessary i thought it was i thought it was really um an interesting take and i've thought a lot about this i've always said if a company if you want a company to change you got to hit them where they live which is in their pocketbook and consumers have to take the the reins and figure out a way to get them to pay a price for their bad behavior and you lose use a lot of examples for that but what got you to uh i mean you're you're a professor of environmental studies and things and you've you've di- you, you dove with sharks and you've done all that you've always been involved in the environmental movement but what got you to write this book was it was it just trying to figure out a, a way to get corporations to practice proper stewardship what yeah exactly i was really tired of sort of being saddled burdened psychologically and then also i think in a in a real sort of actionable way with environmental problems i felt like I was being asked to feel bad and do things like turn off the lights or drive less or take fewer flights. And that made some sense, but it wasn't the kind of change that could really scale. And so I make the argument in the book that those techniques, which are uh, facilitated using guilt to a large degree, um, had eclipsed the tool of, of using shame to go after large corporations or even governments and getting them to change their ways and therefore making these big changes at, at large scales. And I think one of the I mean one of the examples that I really loved is, you know, you made the point that if we all gave up as consumers electricity, it would have the same uh, effect on carbon footprint as if Chevron reduced their consumption by 10%. Yeah, if we all chose to live in the dark. Well, I also love I love the other example where if you if they if you they told you to unplug your cell phone charger, and if all of us did that, it would be equivalent of driving one second less. <laughs> so their their information is so important, and there's a lot of misinformation out there. But knowing the kinds of actions that really make a difference, um, that that's the other thing you touch on in the book. Yeah, exactly. So those are, those are kind of two separate things, right? There's the what can I actually do as an individual to to make a difference, and then there's also what does my individual behavior matter in the face of you know Chevron or Exxon or any of these big companies. And the point is, is that the individual contribution that I actually have to make is basically nothing. I'm mostly powerless to do anything about the environment. Well, unless you're someone like Bill Gates, right? Oh, I, I mean, am. certain individuals have a lot of power. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, for for me at least, as a you know assistant professor, I have very little I can do relative to you know the super powerful mega transnational corporations. Well, you you talk about the limits of shame. You know, your example of <clears throat> how we went from using nets to catch tuna to long line long lining and Bumblebee and Starkist and 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 I think. Heinz owns Bumblebee or something. But they, the big corporations were shamed into behaving differently. That's a, that's an example of not only a success story, but also some shortcomings, which you talk about with the, I think it's the Marine Stewardship Council um, and how people can actually misuse that label and things. But was the tuna, was tuna fishing, um, the change in tuna fishing, was that a success story? 
Yeah, so that is um, with regards to dolphin safe tuna. And yeah. so the question was, how do we go about changing that? Do we get consumers to stop buying um, dolphin unsafe tuna? Or do we make blanket regulations that affect the entire industry? And the argument is that basically whenever you have these little labels like organic foods or fair trade, these are representing uh, across the board, no more than 10% of the marketplace. So as much as you can say, oh, we really want consumers to solve things, uh, you, when you actually look at, at what's going on, uh, it's no more than 10% of the market actually changing. So my point with this example was to say, yes, things did change a little bit. Dolphins do have a, a little bit of a safer life now with the tuna fishing boats, but that was largely as a result of regulation rather than um, a, a totally market-based approach. This is new. This is new information to me. You know, I'm, I'm, I've always Pronto always makes fun of me because I'm always like, well, the marketplace, let it decide. But uh, it was new information for me in that sense that you do, you do need enforcement. You do need regulation. I'll tell you this much: as I hunt, I'm not a hunter, but I do a TV show every year called Meat Eater, and and I hunt with this guy Steve Ranella, who knows everything about animal behavior, and it's a wild show. I've learned more though about the importance of regulation. If you didn't have strict regulation on on hunters. You, I, I, and I don't think a lot of hunters would disagree with this. You would have wholesale slaughter out there. You just have guys drunk with machine guns doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So you. But isn't it true that in, in Michigan, even the legally blind can still hunt? I don't know about that, but uh, listen, I'm an but equal have you opportunity not seen employer. Daredevil, so. like just because a person is blind, like Daredevil proves sense. they can do some next level shit. Yeah, sense, okay, <laughs> sense, where, sense when the, sense where the deer is. Um, no, but I, I uh, so, so your point is that you, you, we can't rely just on shaming corporations. We can't rely just on consumer behavior. You do have to have some form of enforcement coercion, some form of uh, uh, regulation. Is that what you're saying? That's the argument. Well, I, I mean, I think that ultimately is the goal. But let's think about international climate change or, uh, you know, there are problems that are so big and, and seemingly intractable where there is probably no prospect of regulation. And then again, we have to turn back to those more informal tools like shaming and and reputation because, at that level, the real question is, what else do we have? Well, but that's, I mean, you know, then you get into the question. We recently, uh, actually, the last person we interviewed was the former UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And he was talking about, We also you know, had Nor- Naomi Oreskes on, on, yeah, on we this, did. Which, you, which you cite in your book. Yeah, uh, wow, cool. Yeah. Um, we don't play around here. <laughs> Keep going. But, um, you know, I mean, part of the point that he was making is just, you know, there are real consequences to a lack of an effective international sovereignty. And clearly something like global warming is one of those examples. But the question is, yeah, do we turn back to shame to deal with that crisis of sovereignty, or do we accept, hey, we have a real problem with not having an effective international body, and that's something we have to push for, something that but can I don't, regulate But I think Jennifer's things. saying that's not realistic, and the only thing we have is shame at this point for global warming. Well, certainly you, you at this book, point, I mean, but yeah. certainly at this point, but I think that's the thing. I mean, you know, as society becomes more complex and we really become a planetary civilization, we may need to realize that actually we do need some sort of effective international body. Otherwise, we're going to continue continue to see issues like in terms of what uh, Jean-Pierre Oquet was talking about, uh, you know, Syria, right, where we all know that this is a problem. We know, all know that something has been needs to be done, but nobody can step in to create effective peacekeeping because there's no international sovereign body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I wouldn't disagree with that merely just to say that shaming is a stopgap before that system's actually in place. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think I think that what's interesting is that culture or institutions are actually behind biology in this case. Biology and, and chemistry, global ozone, for instance, that has shown us that we are all in it together, right? Whatever we throw into the atmosphere, people in, in Africa will be experiencing the, the effects. Mm. And yet we don't actually have the institutions and governing bodies to actually control for that or have every voice represented in that system. My feeling is that trying to get any kind of international body is going to be about as effective as the United Nations. I don't care what anybody but says. And I think difference. there's got to be a different way. And I think the way to do that is to to tap into the collective conscience, to, to, to say, listen, 
everybody has to do their part. You make a really interesting point about the Kyoto Protocol, which is that the United States forgot that, you know, when Bush said this isn't fair, everybody has to pull their own weight. Well, you know, you make a good point, which is that we also create 80% of, uh, you know, a lot of the, the emissions in some, in some cases or 50% or whatever. So, so when you are contributing uh, that much, spewing that much carbon into the atmosphere, you have a bigger responsibility as a superpower like the United States. Um, I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm very cynical at the idea uh, that you could come up with some sort of global governing council. And that I don't cynicism, think it'll ever happen. But that cynicism is really convenient. Essentially, you're being a merchant of doubt, Brian. I, because I don't believe what you're it's the best is, way to do it, though. No, because you're dissipating responsibility. Listen, when you've got a, a thousand years ago, when you've got people running around, they only have a limited ability to pollute. All they can do is chop down trees, right? That's one thing. But when you have the soci- a society as complex and as planetary as ours, where we have the ability to do real damage, then you you have no choice. As Jennifer is saying, you the you know the biology is I don't remember exactly how you phrased it, but the point is is that you know we are now at a place where we can do real damage, really affect people around the world, and our cultural institutions are lagging behind that. And I don't think that we're going to for very long have the luxury of saying, oh, I don't see that as being realistic and happening. Yes, it wasn't realistic in 1945. My, my argument my but, argument's actually different, Jennifer. I, I think. I don't think that, you know, a centralized power is as effective as sort of uh, uh, diversement. Uh, what is the word? Uh, uh, it's not as effective as, as sort of figuring out a way to deli- um, diversify that sort of authority somehow. I mean, I, I, when, you have a, when you have a governing council, which is never going to happen, I'm sorry, but let's just say it does. I don't know that that's the most effective way to cool the planet. Uh, yeah, but for certain let, thing, I mean, yeah. Jennifer, I mean, isn't it isn't part of the point that there are certain things where the market is effective and we can't just sort of assume because you're still arguing for a market based solution. You're essentially letting everybody compete and let everybody have different points of view and then let the best thing win. I don't think we have a choice. Yeah. Well, the, again, well, that's really cheap. Well, there, easy to it, say. Let's be clear, too, is that what we have right now is not a market based solution. It's a highly subsidized system in which taxpayers are, are bearing a lot of the burden for let's say oil exploration, fossil fuel extraction, et cetera. So it really isn't, if the market did work effectively, if it, in the best case scenario, the market probably would do a better job than whatever we have now, which is actually states complicit with multinationals to, to exploit fossil fuels. That's a really good point. They were, this, with wind energy, the wind energy's uh, argument is that fossil fuels are some of the most sub- highly subsidized uh, energy sources we have, and 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 now they're talking about you know pulling back on subsidies for wind energy. And I think you're right. And it, that that always kind of I always forget that. I always forget how subsidized fossil fuel the fossil fuel industry is, Jennifer. Well, not and not only is it subsidized on the front end, but it's also subsidized on the tail end because it is a harmful pollutant, and it's not being uh, you know the externalities they like to call it in academia, but those those harmful effects that 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 they have the greenhouse gas emissions are not being accounted for in the equation either. So, I think that there's a lot of ways to talk about this, but there's no way to deny that the U.S. and China are two groups of people, countries that uh, emit way more than anyone else. So as much as you want to say, well, I'd like to have sort of states power or we're, it's not, we're not likely to have an international governance system, all eyes really should be on these two countries to really uh, start cooperating with the rest of the world. And that's where informal sanctioning, even on behalf of the UN, on behalf of the Pope, really does matter. Really? Huh. Okay. Yeah, because you're policing behavior. And isn't that I mean, I think what's so great about your book as well is is that you're looking, you know, shame is a part of who we are, and it exists for a reason. And so, you know, let's just talk a little bit about what is the function of shame? Why do we have shame? Yeah, well, so there are two different ways to conceive of shame. One is, of course, as the emotion, which we've all been familiar with, we know the feeling of sort of wanting to hide. And, um, you know, Jonathan Franzen talks about the feeling of wanting to take a shower when he wrote autobiographical sentences. I love that. I love that. He opened the chapter with that awesome quote. Yeah. Yeah. So we have this this intimate, personal experience of shame. Then we, then we also have the more feeling of, of shame as a result of the threat of exposure, which we see increases cortisol level, a stress hormone. It um, leads us to show uh, 
displays of shame, like lowering, lowering our eyes or even blushing, which e- is even one among, of the most... Even among four-year-olds. I, I was fascinated with those, those, that case study that you highlight. Exactly. And four-year-olds are a good test case because they haven't really learned to sort of lie with their signals yet. Yeah. So they lower their eyes and they, um, and they show these increase in, in stress hormones. And then there's the case of shame that I'm most interested in, which is, I don't know necessarily how you feel. I'm not measuring your cortisol. I don't even know that you have a conscience, like in the case of Exxon or Chevron. But I know that somehow you change your behavior due to the threat of exposure. And that's what I'm most interested in is shame as a tool, as a, as a verb. And that's um, one area where our society, especially U.S. society, we've gotten really uncomfortable with that idea. Of course, Monica Lewinsky giving that TED Talk earlier this year entirely against shame. But I think that it's a, it is a tool and it can be used in really appropriate and ways that even the masses uh, vastly support. And isn't, isn't, I mean, part of the reason why the U.S. in particular is so uncomfortable with shame is because we tend towards individualism and we don't like the idea that the community should say what we can and can't do. Yeah, that's um, part of my argument exactly is that it it somehow undermines our, our individualistic thinking. Like, why would I do something that just because the group wanted me to? Um, but in, in some ways, and this is where I think we were talking a little bit over email, um, where I think that the use of shame obviously can be terrible in the case of education or learning, but can be very good for things like behavior or social dilemmas, picking up after your dog, being quiet during class. Um, that, that's the kind of area in which I think shaming, the threat of exposure, the threat of being called out really works better is when your bad behavior actually infringes on someone else's ability to learn. Well, I thought it was really fascinating when you do this study in Indonesia. They asked 75 Indonesians and I think 80 Californians uh, to, yeah. to rate... I thought you'd like that. Yeah, to sort of, <laughs> to sort of rate uh, what their emotions, their top 10 emotions, their top 51 emotions were or whatever. And, yeah. and the Indonesian... The, the, it was fascinating. The Indonesians had afraid somewhere in the top 10. Californians, of course, had frustration and boredom in their top 10 and a fear was way way down the list but i don't think that guilt appears in those 51 emotions uh, uh that the indonesian and guilt is not uh not in this, first of all it doesn't even a, a, a appear in the old testament which i was amazed at and second of all in asian cultures they don't talk about guilt a great deal and there may not even i think in, in the in the, in the, in the case of the indonesia versus california case study I don't think that guilt made it in the top 51 emotions they, they, they talk about experiencing, which was fascinating to me because guilt is such a, maybe it's a Judeo-Christian thing, or maybe it's just a, it's certainly a very Western thing. I mean, mm-hmm. that's how you police yourself. I don't do this because I'm guilty. I, it would create guilt. Uh, and you talk about it being a very good self-policing mechanism, a more subtle mechanism, <clears throat> because if you don't have an, uh, you need an audience for shame. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you need and you need to be uh, it's a very social emotion. And so I argue, I mean, it's just speculation. And that study, by the way, was done by Dan Fessler at UCLA. It's a great it's great work. But I argue that in that Bankulu culture in Indonesia, it's a much more social culture where they're much more around one another, around other people constantly. Whereas in the West, certainly in the U.S., Many of us live alone. We spend great amount, of, great amount of the day alone. And so, what do you use? What emotion would be appropriate in that scenario? It's not the threat of an audience. It's the threat of your own conscience telling you what you've done is wrong. Mm-hmm. And again, we're seeing the breakdown between how we used to live and how we now live 100,000 years later, right? Shame is very effective within a village context. There's 150 people. Everybody sees everybody. Everybody knows everybody. But there's so much anonymity, especially in modern Western society, that, you know, those traditional shame mechanisms aren't necessarily effective. And the funny thing is that with the rise of social media, you now have the return of the global village and the ability to bring shame back in a certain sense. Yeah, I mean, there are obviously benefits and liabilities of the, of that those social networks. Um, I, I really do think that Twitter changed the game a lot because it's open and searchable in a way that Facebook and, uh, you know, even Google Groups, whatever, they aren't. Um, you could uh, maybe the, tr- the same will be true eventually of Instagram or other platforms, but Twitter, because it combines text and images, right? Yeah. It's just so easy to spread information and it's so easy to find it once you know it's out there. 
you know, but there's, and I want you to speak on this. Uh, this is just my observation, but yes, we are um, with the advent of social media shaming becomes easier and in some ways we're being nudged together as this large community however there's also a countervailing force i feel like in the 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 individual is is more sacred than ever somebody's feelings my god god help you if you trample on anyone's sensibilities or feelings in this politically correct world uh yeah uh, i mean my can if i say anything about uh, Caitlyn Brian, say Jenner. Say something now. If say I, something. Don't now. don't do it. <laughs> no, but but I mean, if, if uh, what I was saying about the Caitlyn Jenner thing was this: Look, I don't have any problem. If you want to become a woman or a man, I'm not going to censor you. Guess what I get to do though? If I see a man at 65, who I've known as, a, as an Olympic athlete for 65 years, I'm allowed to go, "Holy shit!" When he turns into a 35 year old woman, I'm allowed to have a minute <laughs> where I go, "This is weird." I don't understand it. I'm even uncomfortable with it. I'm allowed to do that. I'm not allowed to do that if I'm an academic. I'm not allowed to do that if I'm, I'm a yeah. pundit. I'm not allowed to do that if I'm on TV because I'll get in trouble for that because apparently that turns me into somebody who's, you know, a transgender phobe, et cetera, et cetera, which I'm not. But we're very sensitive to an individual's sovereignty. Uh, so do you feel, feel that that's a countervailing force to the idea that we are also being nudged together as a large community? No, I think it's it's interesting you bring this up because it actually speaks to the part of that concern that U.S. society has had with shaming. And a lot of it has centered on this notion of dignity, which there's a lot of debates about it. Mm. But there's no doubt that the idea that, you know, a judge would issue a sentence where you had to carry a sign saying, I'm a thief and I stole from a 16-year-old, that this would be undermining that uh, that very strong American sentiment about the individual and individual rights. Mm. And that is in part why I say we avoid all those arguments and we don't even have to think about them if we instead go after SeaWorld for, you know, having orcas in captivity or uh, Chevron for being one of the biggest polluters or BP. You know, we just avoid all of those discussions if we take it to the group level. But I think, mm. obviously, yeah, so at the group level, I mean, you know, even if corporations don't have a conscience, as you say, they can still be shamed. But I think that part of the value of your book is also understanding the way, the places in which shame is, you know, not just unnecessary, but probably inappropriate. Um, or harmful. Or harmful. Yeah. And I mean, I think in particular political correctness, I mean, I think it's interesting the ways in which it's, a, it, as Brian is saying, it's shameful to even have certain thoughts, and certainly to vocalize them is extremely shameful. But what that ends up doing is is that that ends up destroying the possibility for conversation and for learning um, for the people who do have those thoughts. They just, you know, sort of keep them, they internalize them and don't express them and can't, you know, there's there's really very little opportunity for them to grow past those beliefs. Well, and this is, we're in a point, especially with identity politics or gender, where the pendulum is swinging a bit, right? I think we all have to look at what's going to happen over the long run with these issues. I'm not sure that the Jenner story will be as big of a deal in 10 years the way it was is right now, I right? Agree. I mean, I agree, it, yeah. should it happen then? Yeah, I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. I, I think when this is the first time that transgender people have been able to even just come out and breathe so there's going to be a exactly. lot of there's going to be a lot of noise man there's, there's going to be a lot of heavy sighing oh yeah there's, there's going to be a right. lot of that 100 percent. brian could you do some heavy sighing for us right now <laughs> no, yeah. no. I, I was i already did that when i saw jennifer jacquet's uh, pictures so. <laughs> <laughs> i mean beauty I beauty, beauty and brains that's kind of ridiculous that. my lord yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, can we can we even just talk about some of those places where shame is counterproductive? And then, you know, because I mean, I think that's the thing you had, there's, I believe, seven tools of effective shaming that you have in there. Yeah, that's great. Um, would you mind yes. taking us through those? Well, I mean, there are quite a number of them. Um, but I think the and, you know, I, since the book has come out too, I've done some more thinking on this. But First of all, I think there has to be a, a large gap between desired and and, and uh, the actual behavior. So shaming is not a tool you should reach for for sort of minor transgressions, right? Like it needs to be big, and that's and that's for all sorts of reasons. But uh, it protects the people at risk of being shamed, and it also protects us as the audience because we're being asked to lend our attention to these causes. 
in general, shaming works better, I think, for effectiveness, for scale, by aiming at groups or institutions rather than individuals. But I also cite uh, counterpoints to that in the book. Um, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I was just I was just thinking as you were saying that that I also feel like sh- shame is used in some ways to keep us from embracing our biology just a little too much. I'm just thinking about as a man and the appalling thoughts I have. Now, luckily, as a comic, I can talk about them on stage, but I have the most appalling thoughts in the world. You know, I'm married with kids, but listen, you know, uh, it's a 12-step program, and, 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 and that's just the way it is, and God help me if I if I even voice some of my my uh, what's my baser sort of thoughts do it brian men, voice them now. now you know you know i've always been open about who i am but men men well that's are, because men why are you shamed. became a comedian yeah, it's probably what it is i can get up on stage and say whatever the hell i want but right. but men are you know i know a lot of it's really interesting to watch nowadays because men will behave one way and as soon as the women leave the room and it's a bunch of guys that trust each other holy shit it just becomes a literally a different conversation i mean you're talking about a bunch of animals suddenly everything uh, suddenly the truth comes out and and i feel Feel like in today's world we're not living in mad men times today's world men have been sort of shamed into behaving in ways that don't necessarily uh, reflect their biological their biology in general their urges their 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 aggression uh, their sexuality etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah well i mean there's a it's a lot of it's a socially uh, grooming tool. It's for social grooming. And so, yes, it's a very good thing you're equipped and sensitive to it because that's probably how you manage to have a wife and those children. Yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, you'd be stuck with those men all the time. You'd yeah. be a sociopath, Brian. You'd be a sociopath. <laughs> well, I'd just be a single dude in a convertible at 48 years old with like chains and a silk shirt. It'd be, it'd be very sad. Which dying, you... I do dye my beard, but I'd, <laughs> I'd be dying my hair too. It'd be very sad. So thank well, God and for there sharing. are ways that you behave, uh, you know, in, in sort of just that you might not actually tolerate if those actions were taken in real life. You know, we all have, this is a question of what is your true self and, you know, what the kind of boundaries you have. Well, that's but, a, but, it, but it begs a bigger question, right? So, which is, which is shame is there for a reason. And I think shame is as, look, there are certain things we all want to do. We want to behave according to our appetites. But then we know that when you do that, you fall short. You just do. Um, it's not the way to behave. So th- it requires certain self-restriction, yeah. right? And I, I think shame feels as though it might, ha- might be a very naturally occurring phenomenon, and it probably exists in every society that's ever been in, in one form or another. And it's there it because— It certainly does. Yeah. It, and we know that because of the guests that we're interviewing on Friday, Brian. <laughs> Uh, uh, Dr. Paul Ekman. Yes, yes. Um, but 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 so Jennifer, in a way, it's it's kind of evolved. It's an evolutionary thing, isn't it? Most certainly. I mean, this what Darwin was fascinated. Why do the why do even the blind blush? People who had been congenitally blind since birth. Yeah. And this shows how innate shame is to to us as a as a culture and as, as social lubrication. But. Um, The reasons why it's felt over what those have changed greatly over time. That's where culture plays such a role. So we have this this hard drive, but the software is very, very much informed by culture. Mm. That's yeah, that's that that makes sense. I forgot about that experiment with with blind people who had been blind from birth. They still experience shame. And I think behave physically the same way people who can see because you did that study with judo right. players judo judoka guys. my colleague jess tracy and and her colleague did yes yeah and they and they they look at when when one the judo when the one side wins they behave their hands go up in the air they're they're they look to the sky and when the the person that loses their body language is identi- you know they kind of look down their mouth slumps they, they, their 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 arms kind of dangle at their sides exactly and blind people have a very very similar people who've been blind since birth have a very Identical. similar thing without even looking without even having learned that behavior visually amazing uh, yeah. now do you want to see a really great example of that software being different that culture at work yes because every single time a study is brought up jennifer is sure to give credit to somebody else 
for that because she's a well-trained academic and fears the shaming of plagiarism more than anything. <laughs> Whereas anytime something is brought up, Brian, you pass it off as your own. You're damn right. You're <laughs> damn right I do. Jennifer who? Hey, guys, is shame really necessary? Can't wait. To, I'll be dropping this. I'll be, I'll be quoting this book at, at parties. for Hunter always busts me for that. I just steal from people like yourself, and I just sound smart. That's great. Yeah, you have no, there's no cultural norm working again. <laughs> what, whatever. I'm a comedian. They expect me to be an idiot anyway it's just great i get to read these yeah, books and, right. and listen to this stuff um, um yeah but I, the the other thing i mean I, I i we emailed a little bit about this but the thing i kept on wondering is i think that this sort of very functional approach where you know the we're really looking at what is this emotion that we're hardwired for offer us you know how can we use it constructively how can we best use it you know i mean i, I personally and i don't know if this is something you would do but i would love to see this approach for other emotions like a real breakdown of what's our mental toolkit and how can we apply it in different situations have you thought about that well, I mean, so one, again, academics super guilty of doing this, so I'm hesitant to do it now, but just a quick caveat, which is to say, I'm really not convinced that so much of the behavior changes that I've seen in my experiments, other people have seen in theirs with regards to, let's say, smoking or, or losing weight or these responses, even from SeaWorld, their stock value dropping 60% after the film Blackfish comes out, is that as a result of feeling a particular emotion? I'm not convinced it is. I'm not in our experiments where we exposed um, the least cooperative players in a game. I'm I didn't take cortisol levels, but I'm almost certain from looking at the players that they weren't experiencing much stress. But I think that it's about the threat of shame on the people who would experience it, and it's it's. Um, in that way, the tool operates a little differently than the emotion itself. And I guess my question would be how prevalent or present the emotion has to be for the tool to work anyway. And in terms of other, I, th I think a really related emotion to that is, let's say, disgust. Mm -hmm. So uh, an emotion that is really linked to norms, right? So about sanitation, for instance, huge for disgust. And um, where you hear almost, um, you're, you're, I'm sure you'll love this, Brian, given that you're on the hunting show and, and probably at like a, a crazy carnivore, but often you'll hear like <laughs> vegetarians talking about how disgusting meat is, which is really interesting that white, the, white, the, the white sort of urban left and right. Mostly white urban women, by the way, from what I understand. Most vegans are white urban women, which is interesting. From, 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 uh, who was it who came on our uh, Are you shocked by that? Uh, no, I'm not at all. I'm, I, I've spent enough time around white urban women to, to believe that for some, for and whatever reason. And that's John reason. Durant, yeah. John author Durant. of the Paleo. Leo Manifesto. That's right. That's right. That, um, that was his. That was his finding. I thought that was interesting. Are you a, a Jennifer? Are you a vegan? I am a card card toting vegetarian, as my colleague <laughs> likes to say. You'd rather be a, a an aspiring vegetarian than a failing vegan. So. I can't. I can't um, get you. I can't get you out on a hunt. Then obviously, <laughs> no, never. Well, for, you know, but, uh, yeah. Uh, but but I, I will say, I will say that w what's interesting about hunting is that the, the guys I hunt with know more about animal behavior and conservation than anybody. So, sure. Uh, but, sure. But, but uh, I, <laughs> I don't like killing the animal either. But I'm a, well, I'm no. So, the, so my point is merely that disgust is one of those things that really depends on. It's it's very uh, dependent on your morality or your view of a certain issue. So you'll hear the right saying that that gay marriage is disgusting, and you'll hear vegetarians saying that meat eating is disgusting. So this is one of those those emotions that is really used to, to change behavior. But, and I mean, the, I keep on thinking about disgust in the context of campaign finance. Like, until you can really mm -hmm. trigger, like, mass disgust on the part of the American yes. people about campaign finance, you're not going to see any social change. Um, you know what, though? You have to be, as, as I'm thinking about the tools, and you talk about this as well, but when it comes to shame and these kind of tools that the public can use, Man, you better know what you're talking about, too. You've got to be very, you know, one of the things about the global warming debate that you hear people say is they say, well, OK, the, the globe is warming. I, I've heard people on the right say the globe may be warming. The question becomes, uh, is it human attribution? And, right. and, and also and also what's the best best way 
to tackle yeah, this. But that's is be- is regulation going to cool stop cooling the planet? Those are those are viable questions. And if you start, no, they're the questions that they can now ask. Like in the same way that creationism could be really really dumb 150 years ago, mm. and they've had to sort of reinvent the narrative to make sure that it's at a level of complexity or subtlety that's just beyond what the average person understands to keep creationism viable. That's why you have intelligent design. That's why they fixate on certain like issues like the eye, and then they say. Science can't explain the eye, which is not true. But the, you know, you see the same thing going on with global warming. Initially, you know, the the argument was very simplistic. And now they're just trying to focus on finer and finer and finer points because that's what merchants of doubt do. Mm. They just have to maintain that state of doubt. And as long as you can maintain that doubt, then no action is necessary. Mm. Yeah, and this pre- this presents a really, this is what is interesting about Oreskes and Conway's work is that they actually put the focus of, of shaming, of, of course, the individuals themselves are mentioned, but on this system, right, on this method, the methodology of, of continually finding a small sliver and, and honing in on it to, to perpetuate a, a, a feeling of doubt over the subject. And that is that to me can lead to real change. I mean, the very fact that you just said it, you just summarized it so perfectly now. It's it's really it's really a major advance in the last, I'd say, decade. Damn, yeah, a, damn you, Hunter. Impressing, well, impressing but Jennifer. Listen, damn it's it. not me. That's the thing. I'm also well trained as an academic, so I'm clear that this is not my work and I'm sure to attribute it properly. Um, yeah. but the but I think that's the thing, exactly. Like that's such a powerful heuristic. Um, the idea that sort of mental shortcut, oh, merchants of doubt, and then you can spot merchants of doubt in action. Like Brian is sometimes that, you know, especially around anything that would suggest that the market is not perfect. Um, and, you know, the, those sorts of mental tools, I think, are so powerful. And that's what's so great about your book is, you know, it's really making us aware of what those mental tools are so that we can then think about, okay, how do we apply them? Okay, we've got disgust available to us. How do we trigger and develop discussed around campaign finance so that we can fix the problem much, much more quickly rather than just, you know, sort of appealing to our sense of rationality and throwing out a bunch of statistics that hit most of us like a lead brick. Yeah. And, and I think as you point out, so there's, if you said, well, where is the science to show that, um, let's say that children do better um, if they're not beaten regularly? (laughs) I mean, these are not the reasons that we have these norms in our society. Science was not the reason. Um, In fact, you couldn't even get that experiment through IRB, right, through ethical review. So I think in some cases there's the argument, and and that's why I was mentioning about the Pope or the UN, of moving some of these issues that are pretty clear on the science more into that moral domain rather than purely in the scientific realm. Mm. Right. And I think that's the thing. I mean, exactly. Like, that's a great example in terms of beating children. There are so many of these questions where, you know, if you start going back to what is the logic of this? Do we really have the science to it? It becomes massively complex. You then have to descend down a okay, wormhole. Okay, but, but Hunter, like, I mean, as an example, uh, in, in uh, Stephen Pinker's book, Blank Slate, you know, when, when anthropologists started coming back up to studying indigenous cultures and saying, you know what? Uh, aggression is might very well be a natural phenomenon among men especially oh and by the way here's the other thing we're starting to find men who kill more other more people in battle tend to sire more children because they're more sexually desirable by the women in those in those in those tribes and and that, that, that's what you know a lot of the, a lot of them came back those anthropologists and things were shamed shamed beyond you know that their careers were hurt and everything else shame was used to silence them to ridicule them and to uh to damage or to at least discredit their work uh so all i'm saying is that you know we have to be we do have to be careful you do have to settle on some science before no you, you have to be you willing to mobilize these you forces. have to be willing to wade into it right yeah but let's be honest like, uh, let, i'm sorry to, let me sorry just yeah. give another point you know, you're, you may be a, a vegetarian, um, Jennifer, but for, if, if somebody came to me and said being a vegetarian is better for your body, right. I would hit you with a whole bunch of science, especially as a guy who was pretty physically active, to, 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 counter, to counter, counterbalance that. And I'd say actually eating meat is healthier or just as healthy or whatever. And, and the science there is not settled. It may right. be that some people have a different metabolic type and vegetables work better for them and, and people some people can eat exclusively just meat and fat. Whatever the case. I do think that 
it's a big responsibility when you start using when you start triggering tools like disgust and shame in this case but people you are gotta be, all, you do have to settle on science a- absolutely but people are all the time right but the point is is that look at for example back to merchants of doubt like that's really effective neurolinguistic programming like those people understood how human psychology works mm-hmm. and they used it to their end mm-hmm. that's right mm-hmm. there's this constant war going on and yes as each individual you have to make sure that you are being intellectually responsible Responsible and making sure that you are advocating for the right thing, right? Right. And hopefully, and I, and I think Naomi and Oreski's book it, well, it was very clear to say that the people who are denying this were physicists who had an ideology, which is a libertarian ideology, and that's what they weren't even being scientific about their no. argument and and sowing the seeds of doubt, Far not from not it. from a scientific platform, but actually from a political platform. Far from it, right? S- sorry, Jennifer, we're talking lots here. No, I, I am fully and fully support of what you're talking about. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty almost around around so many issues, but where you see it really um, uh, being discussed are are over areas that are politically problematic. More so, you know, we're not really talking about the uncertainty around string theory nearly as much as around global warming, yes. and that's because there, no one has skin in that game. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Really yeah, and I think, and that's the point, is, is that there's obviously such an agenda to maintain doubt. And I think, per, per what you said, like Eric Conway and Naomi Oreskes did such a good job of articulating that there is such a fight to maintain doubt. And it's not, people are not engaging with the science. Like, it's not, you know, your father is a global warming denier, but it's not that he is really engaging in the science and really making a conscientious, slow, rational process of trying to learn environmental science and trying to understand how the climate works. No, he's made a decision, and then he goes about trying to aggregate facts that support his argument, which is, by the way, what we all do. Like, Mm -hmm. we all make a point, we all make our decisions, like, that's Jonathan Haidt's work, right? And, you know, Emily Pronin, I mean, I'm I'm trying to drop as many scientific names as Jennifer is, but, but, (laughs) but, you know, they, 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 you know, you form a conclusion, and then you go looking for data that supports that conclusion. That's what human beings do. And actually, or you base your conclusion on someone who trusts conclusions. Totally. And I actually, your doctor. Re- there was something I read. Oh, by the way, I- Hunter and I have been talking a lot. This is what you get when you have a beautiful vegetarian uh, <laughs> brainiac on, and, and now you've got two men competing for your attention. Yeah, this exactly. Is, somebody like, shame us immediately. No, this is lecking, right? Like this is classic <laughs> male behavior. Like we're trying to impress her. <laughs> <laughs> like, I want to take my shirt off right now. <laughs> well, Brian, fortunately, we're not Luckily, using video. Luckily, I'm multitasking. So oh, okay. <laughs> she's, so, she's so not interested. She's 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 probably cleaning her cabinets or something. You know. Um, right. But yeah, there was something I read. I can't remember who it was, and you might know. But that the the argument was actually I know who sent it to me. But the the argument was that uh, reason did not evolve for rationality. It evolved for essentially to recruit people over to our side like it's not is that do you do you recall that i can look it up um no i don't i don't recall all that but it sounds pretty convincing on the other hand it also sounds very american so i'm a little bit wary of you know this is the question with even these anthropologists i think the real argument in all of this is where does biology stop and culture begin and Mm -hmm. and with shame what's very clear is that, yeah, there are some norms that that most societies, if not all societies, share. But a lot of it is very plastic. And we're in the battle zone always for these new norms and and to get rid of old norms. And in the 21st century with these huge global problems, uh, I think that that social exposure, reputation, given that, you know, there's so much institutional back and forth is going to be playing just a bigger and bigger role. Well, that's mm-hmm. awesome. And what what else are you working now? Are you going to keep doubling down on shame and studying shame? Or are you going to expand your research? I am doing both, actually. And I am duh. Working, <laughs> uh, duh, working a bit on um, shame and climate change specifically, given the COP21 meeting at, at later this year and the Obama administration announcing that it would take a name and shame approach to climate change. So all of that is pretty exciting for my realm of research. And then, you know, I do other stuff related to fish and gender and academia and, and a bunch of other things. For, to the, keep, for, the, for, you know. the, for the record, it worries me that the government is starting to name and shame, of course. Anybody who has that much power. Uh, well, how that, do you uh, feel as a Californian about the, the tax delinquent list? Um, I, 
I think California's taxes are already way too high. It's I think. Okay, but what about not paying them entirely? Which is what the list is, right? That you shame the top 500 tax delinquents in the state, yeah. get, in, get a letter that say your name will go online if you don't pay up. Some of them owe like $3 million, $5 million, $10 million in back taxes. Um, my, my initial reaction is I can't stand any, any sort of uh, abuse of power that way. Um, I think there's a better way to do it. Maybe not. Uh, my other reaction is I think California has been taxing people at such a high rate anyway. And uh, so I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I have an emotional reaction to that, which is probably not on the side of the government. But if I had to be really objective about it and I was trying to solve a problem as a government employee... Um, I, I think it's effective. Um, I just I worry about that precedent. I worry about the government making taking your anonymity and y- exposing you because you broke a law. There are enough laws on the books already when you evade taxes that you can go to jail and you get audited and things like that. Yeah, but the difference when is the government no, is you can't business, you can't go to jail at the state level. No, but when the government is in the business of humiliating somebody. But Brian, uh, I, I have a problem with. Let it. me ask you this, right? So let's say that you've got somebody who hasn't paid all of their taxes, mm. right? What do you think the consequence of that is for you? Well, I, I don't know. But well, I, take take I, a I, wild I guess. I, I don't know, but but I taxes I, get raised. Part of the reason why your taxes are so high is because you've got people who are defectors from the community and don't pay their taxes. And when you have all these people who don't pay their taxes, the only option is to raise the taxes on the whatever percentage. I'm not. That do I'm pay. not sure. I agree with you, but I'll grant you that argument. I, I'm, I'm not so sure. It goes back to. If you can shame somebody for not paying their taxes and you're the government you, and, and you can do with their anonymity as you please, you can do that with a lot of other things. And I think it sets a dangerous precedent and I'm never in favor of some centralized power like the Obama and uh, like the federal government, like the state government, making that decision, having a council meeting and deciding we're going to expose these what do you, people what do you they think don't pay, happens? pay their taxes. But I, think I, don't, that- I don't think that's the most effective way and... And frankly, I think taxes are too high. I pay. Yeah, you know, but part of the of reason money. why they're too high is because <laughs> that's these not people, true. That is that's true. That's not why they tax higher. You just granted this, this, me that this point state, and then withdrew this state, it. This <laughs> state, I'm not granting you that point. You the, did though. That's not why California has high taxes. It's part that, of it's, it. It's it's because go- government knows how to do that, and that's the only, they know how to raise taxes and pass laws. Oh, Mike Callan. But back. but it's true. Yeah, but <laughs> it's true. I mean, that, that, that everybody, a government. I'll tell you what a government always needs. Yeah. More money. They just do. Why? Because they're human beings and they want to solve problems. Well, but How do you solve a problem when you're in government? We'll ra- we need money. We'll raise taxes. But They'll by, keep doing that until let, you get to 70%. Let me ask you this, I mean, Brian. Do you think we use shame on our politicians? Do we think we... We do, but I think you've entered into... you. That is a contract you've entered into as a, as a public well, figure. Well, as a citizen, you've entered into a contract to pay your taxes. Like, if you don't want to pay your taxes, okay. you can pull in Eduardo Saverin and give up your U.S. citizenship okay, so, and so go both, move so to let Singapore. Me ask, let me ask you and Jennifer a question. Then yeah. if, if that's the case, okay... So, 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 uh, paying taxes and you, you, they're delinquent, and so the government is taking the 500 most egregious violators of this and they're exposing them. Okay, how about this, guys? Why don't we do the same thing with people who commit adultery? Well, that's the thing. Firstly, is that something that is the government's responsibility? It hurts children. You can make that uh, argument. Yeah, but the point is, is that is that the government's responsibility? And you also have to allow that if the government misuses shame, when people misuse shame, that's the point, and that's part of the point of the book. Well, that's there's the question, a, though, Gen- Jennifer. Is, is this? Do you not believe that's a misuse of shame, or do you do you support the government? No, that's, well, that that's, is in fact what the church, who acted as the government, used to do. Right? That was the premise of the Scarlet Letter. Exactly. Was but that to wasn't shame. my point, Brian? Okay, but wait, wait, Jennifer, speak to that for a sec. Well, t- so what? There, there are two things that are are interesting about that example. One is that uh, we no longer view the the case of adultery to be really in the in the realm. I think this is your point too, Hunter, of the state. That's not really the state's business, except when it comes to actually about you know divorce settlements. Mm-hmm. Then it does right play a role. Sure. And, and then the other question is, and, and I think you're trying to make the point about children, right, is to what extent can you argue that this behavior really has an effect on society at large? And the, I'd argue that in the tax case, it's a much stronger example. In the same way, it's a much stronger example with secondhand smoke 
uh, than it is with obesity or in this case adultery. We're like st- whatever. We're still talking about degrees here, Jennifer. Though we're still talking about degrees. Yeah, but as soon as you start uh-huh. using thin end of the wedge arguments, Brian, then you can stop us from doing anything. Right. Like everything is potentially a slippery slope. Right. But you have to make certain choices. I mean, if the government starts policing people's right to murder, then the next thing you know, you know, they'll be uh, policing adultery. Right. The point is, is that if the government and yes, Jennifer, those were the points that I was making. But I would also add another one, which is, is that if the government abuses the use of shame, if the community feels that they're going too far with that stuff, let me tell you, the community will lash out so fast. I mean, look at I mean, until Spence, Hunter, you have a council on shame. Until you have a czar, no, a shame czar. That's the point cetera, of right? no, Brian. Listen, but isn't that what happens? Can I be appointed? Yes, czar, <laughs> Jennifer, you will. I, I, all my meat rights. I won't get any bacon. It's going to be outrageous. <laughs> but actually, I'll put an end to comedy in general. I, I, you're so you're so mean. You're so beautiful yet so mean. <laughs> um, but but yeah, that's the point. Is is that listen? You know, look at social media. People try and go too far with things. You know, they slap people back. Like there's a there's a constant back and forth that happens and you know well we- what I'm saying to you right now is I think what, what you just asked me my point of view on that Jennifer did and I'm saying my slap back is I think that's an abuse of power well, that's when, fine. when you when you expose. But you know, Brian, the let's talk. I mean, listen. Taxpayers. Since I mean, this is in the news. This couldn't get more relevant. What do you think the problem is in Greece? Like a huge, huge part of the problem in Greece sure. is is that you know they lived under the Ottoman Empire. They therefore didn't pay their taxes mm-hmm. because they're like, why should I pay taxes to an imperial overlord? Mm-hmm. The Greeks think of ta- paying your taxes as theft, right? And the result is you don't have a functioning economy. Now, fortunately, we don't have the level of tax defection in California or in the U.S. that they have in Greece, but at the extremes, tax defection becomes a real problem. And if I've got a choice, and if I've got a choice, Brian, between passing legislation because that's the point. As Jennifer said, it is not a crime at the state level to defect on your taxes. It's if- not a crime, Jennifer? No, you. There's no, there's no state debtor's prison, only at the federal level. Right. Really? Yeah. So if you you're if you're if you've got a choice between a new law that sends more people to prison, which is expensive, mm-hmm. and publishing, and will raise your taxes, and will raise your taxes, right? Mm-hmm. Or pay, putting out a list of 500 people, and it's a list online, and that hopefully gets some of them to pay more of their taxes. And putting up that list costs, you know, a dollar, hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. And the, they've gotten over $400 million in back taxes. And the real, in, really interesting point about this that I think does help uh, address some of your concerns, Brian, is just that the the threat of exposure leads people to pay their taxes. They get a letter that says your name will go on this list, and that's when they decide to pay before there's any humiliation, before they've they've been listed online. And you're not talking about... Uh, people who can barely scrape together the money. You're talking about millionaires right. who have well, decided uh, based on an ideology or or whatever. It's hard <laughs> to, to, to know for certain their motivations, but it's not for lack of cash. I, I'm just excited um, I don't get put in jail for not paying my state taxes. Well, exactly. but, 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 you know, they did. The, the U.S. government did something very interesting with Swiss the Swiss bank accounts. A lot of people were hiding money in the Swiss bank accounts, and they, 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 said, they said to people, they said, we are going to... The Swiss government is going to give a grant us access, I think, to 50% or 30% of all the bank accounts, and you you can take a risk. You can decide not to divulge how much money you have in Swiss bank accounts, but if we find, if you're one of the 30%, and we find out that you're, you're, you're going down, we're coming after you with everything we have, and guess what? People went, I don't want to, I don't want to take a 30% chance, 50% chance I'm going to jail, so here's all my information. Um, so... That that was one case where a threat of jail mm-hmm. was, but 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 Jennifer, it goes back to this. Uh, I didn't know actually that you couldn't go to jail for being delinquent on your state taxes. No, you, but you can be docked your pay when you're audited. Can't you? Can't your? Can't they put a lien on your paychecks and things? I mean, you you will pay a price for that, right? Well, a lot of the. I mean, so I I'm not an accountant or yeah. and I, or a lawyer, but. My understanding from speaking, I did speak to the, the tax um, people in California, and, and by the way, 20 other states have this policy as well, but um, is that they can work to confiscate uh, some of your goods, but only second homes and luxury vehicles. And wow. this takes an enormous amount of resources at the state level to try to get those yeah, uh, yeah, those assets under state you, holding. You both make a good argument if it costs less and it's not 
it's it's not as coercive. I, I could be swayed. Yeah, a hundred thousand oh, well, dollars. I love it when people change their minds. Yeah, a hundred thousand yes. dollars in costs for four hundred million in revenue, Brian. That's like investing. Damn it, Hunter. In, that's like investing in Facebook in two thousand four. Let 2004. the market decide. Yeah. <laughs> for God's sake, you guys, you're cha- you're shifting my paradigm right now, and that's what this show's all about: changing our mind. That's why we have people like Jennifer Jacquet on our Jacquet. Jacquet. I just like Jacquet. <laughs> Jacquette. I'm happy with either. Assistant Professor of Environmental Studies at New York University. I'm jealous. Are you in New York City right now? I'm not, actually. I'm on the West Coast. If you'd, if you'd told me, I would have done this at a more reasonable hour. You could have Where come in. Where are you? We're, we're in the West Coast. I'm actually in, in I, I'm afraid to admit this, as I've seen some of your reactions so far, but I'm in Canada. Oh, well, I, my favorite place to perform. We're in Canada. It's my favorite place. Vancouver. Love oh, Vancouver. Wow. La- I'll be Brian's right. yeah. huge in Canada. Uh, sell out two weeks in advance, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, I'm sure you're oh, very okay, impressed. Okay, great. You're, yeah, this is me lecking. Am I lecking or just you showing You are off? lecking. I'm just it's showing the off. same thing, Brian. They Le- need some humor up here, you know. It's it's some of my favorite audiences. My favorite audiences are either in Miami or in uh, or in Canada. It's either very south or very north. It's really interesting. But anyway, um, Jennifer, thank you for doing this podcast you've taught me some stuff not only with your book but with your discussion and you might even have changed my small mind (laughs) well (laughs) thanks for reading it was apparent that you actually did it and the book is brian is shame necessary i'm not even reading this out i just know it old new uses for an old tool um and i think jennifer this is the first that this is probably the most hunter and i have gone back and forth we've been fighting essentially over you <laughs> so, so i uh, guess i feel honored you should you okay, should great. just a couple of macho dudes i don't know uh, how macho i am but well, i but i certainly you're tall well, and you're you should arm wrestle before you know we hang up i think oh. hunter's naturally stronger he's just a i do have guy. leverage on brian that is true and he's got a bigger brain i'll tell you that much that's not true uh you do um jennifer um thank you for joining us this was fun you're welcome back anytime and good luck in what else you're working on and write more books <clears throat> That's right. Will do. Thanks for having me. Tell Obama to be careful with his name and shame business. (laughs) All right? Because he doesn't know that he's right the whole time. And you tell him something else for me. He's never really made a business run, and he didn't leave much of an academic or legislative legacy. It's not. And I voted for him. And I voted for him, by the way. I still am not crazy about him. Uh, I'll let you tell him yourself. It sounds like you. Brian, do you know what's also really funny, though? Is that let's imagine Obama's like, wow, I had such a good experience on Mark Maron. I'd love to do the Brian (laughs) Callen show. Yeah. You would change your tune so fast. I'd be kissing his ass yeah, the whole time. so hard. I voted for him, so why not? Jennifer, if I do shoot another deer, I promise you before I squeeze the trigger, I'm going to say, Jennifer, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your empathy. You got it. Thanks for your book, Is Shame Necessary? Uh, new uses for an old tool. Go get it, uh, and we'll put it on our website. Thank you. Bye. Awesome. That was amazing. She's great, and uh, I'm sorry she didn't Skype with us. Uh, well, she did Skype, we were, but you would have liked to have seen her face. She's beautiful. She is beautiful. Um, and smart, and uh, a good book, and a liberal, and a vegetarian. And <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, it was good. But I think to good. a certain extent, like I th- that's what I think is so exciting about all this evolutionary psychology, mm. is just that it's really, it's post-partisan. You know, yeah. I mean, it's really just like, this is who we are. This yeah. is how things work. Let's look at the science. And then you start to cut through and yeah, you can have these real conversations about like what's effective. I mean, you know, a lot of what she said was very fiscally conservative. She's like, you know, you want to recoup $400 million in taxes? You can do it for $100,000 if you understand how human beings actually that's, that's work. That's actually a very good point. Yeah. That's a very good point. I mean, that that, that is a very cheap way to do it and it's not that coercive it's just it's just shaming somebody yeah and some people can see can, can have the option of saying fuck you i don't care totally but i i, I have been swayed to yeah. your camp Brian, damn it it's not my camp it's the truth camp okay which i it, just i it joined did make a, sense yeah and i think and it took me 58 minutes and seven seconds <laughs> but i came around but brian that's an amazing turnaround do you know how long it took huma- humanity to figure out that the earth goes around the sun like thousands of years I know, but i'm the leader of humanity you are i set the you standard are. I you set, are i'm the future man you are ladies and gentlemen. the universal man brian mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you've been on the hero's journey by the way uh for any of you listeners out there um if you want to see me live uh, you get to Denver, July 16th, 17th, and 18th. Comedy Works downtown. I will be bringing heat. I will be bringing heat. 
uh, and I got a whole new act. Not really, but a lot of new stuff. A- but- anybody who comes to Denver will see all new stuff, all new material. Well, Brian, let me ask you this. Does laughter sound different? at a higher altitude. Damn right it does. <laughs> Damn right it does. I always run out of bed. Peace, everybody. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show with Brian Callen. Be sure to like him on Facebook. Just search for Brian Callen Comedy. And follow him on Twitter. Just search for at Brian Callen. You can also find him online by visiting his website. Just go to briancallen.com. Until next time, bye-bye. 